Here's a man that needs no introduction in our circles. I guess he's going to be in too. So you can oh, no. Him. Here's Jeanette Cook, our hostess. Well, Come on, Jeanette. Sit down here. No, so they can see you. I'm going to make your uh, internet debut. Um, I know most all of you, and most all of you know me a little bit. There's a couple that I don't know completely here. Right? So when I stand up here, I'm not just. Uh, and uh, I am not the Please mute your mics. So, 
come and speak All to right. us. And well, thank you for that very, very, thank you for that very, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. I don't think I can live up to half the things that she's talking about, frankly. And then that's one of the problems of being introduced. You never can, you know, meet the expectations people have. So I just want you to know that I have, um, I think I've forgotten more than I ever learned. <laughs> because, you know, as you get uh, along, things begin to evaporate. And so if you get anything out of me that's, that's comprehensible tonight, I think you're doing a, I think you're, you're, you're doing well. And uh, I do appreciate you all coming. And uh, it's great to be in uh, Oklahoma. Never been here before. And uh, didn't know you had this kind of weather, as I said. And uh, it was a really interesting experience to, uh, to see how it goes. Man, I just want to talk about one or two things here on the table. Well, you better stand up. I don't know what I'm going to do. I haven't decided. I don't know. I may sit down again. I don't want to be. I don't want to be. You know, chained to your little machine here. Okay, just let's just leave it. Okay, because I don't. All right, that's the way it is. Thanks. Uh, I have um, some books here that uh, uh, that I just want to show and mention to you. Uh, I might sit down if I get tired of standing up, but uh, you know, um, this is what the one I'm most well known for. Uh, and it's still in print. It's James, the brother of Jesus. It, it did make a big uh, impact, actually. I'm not bragging about it, but it actually did, because no one even seemed to realize Jesus had a brother. But the Gospels speak about brothers. James, Josie's, uh, Jude, and uh, so on. Four brothers, as I recall. Even the that's why I don't want this thing, you know, I don't want to <laughs> turn this gadget off. But, uh, you know, um, if my brain doesn't remember the fourth brother, you probably remember his name already. It's Simon, that's it. But, you know, this one here put James on the table. Now, uh, all kinds of people are writing about James, the brother of Jesus. But it is a thousand pages. And if there's anything that I left out, let me know. <laughs> Hey, look, can you turn this thing off because I can't function yeah, with this I thing. Huh? I yeah. mute the whole thing. I thought we were doing. Well, I did too, <laughs> but you got some people on here. Look at all those people. That uh, Are you all muted, please? Let me see if I can mute all. Well, let's mute the muter. This is half your audience here. The mutation. The someone that's on the phone is not muted. Uh, eight, three, two, or something like that. He asked me if they turn this thing up, and I said, "Yeah," but I made a big mistake when I when I uh, when I when I agreed to that. Anyway, so this, as it turns out, is one book, and I didn't bring another one. I thought you had some copies of that. It's a big, heavy-duty book with an orange uh, cover called the New Testament Code, and it's another thousand pages of all the stuff I cut out of this one. <laughs> and actually, if you dig deep into that, the publishers were so peeved about that book because they don't like to publish these heavy books because then they have to spend a lot of time printing and the paper costs you money and stuff like that. So if you, um, if you, um, if you look in that book, there are a lot of footnotes and the publisher refused to put the footnotes in the back of the book because it would have cost them extra pages. So we have to put the footnotes up online. So the footnotes are on my website, roberteisenman.com. It's easy to remember. I don't have to spell it out. My name.com. And the footnotes for the New Testament code are on, are on, uh, are on the, are online. But the, the chap who's been reprinting all these things, the, a lot of these books here are reprints from this fellow called Grave Distractions. They're all on that website, roberteisenman.com or Robert H. Eisenman.com. He's been reprinting a lot of these things that I used to write, like here too, that I wrote 40 years ago, that got, that got me going for E.J. Thrill and Leiden when I was an academic, and Leiden was a big name, so you could get tenure if you published for Leiden. You're not gonna get tenure if you publish for Grave Distractions, I can tell you, but uh, these are two uh, Leiden books that he reprinted here. And um, uh, the point is that, 
um, he actually put this other book, the New Testament Code, up online. And he put all the footnotes, I mean, he, out in a book like this. And he put all the footnotes in a separate volume. So he's actually selling the footnotes in another 300 page separate separate volume. And I think it's the New Testament Code Part 2 or something like that. And uh, so he's published the footnotes, which are really, uh, I actually had to add some footnotes because when we put the book up online, I hadn't finished the footnotes. And sometimes you don't have the actual text for the footnotes and the numbers stay in, but you weren't, you were going to take them out and then sequence them. Well, the publishers published the book in the original copy that they gave, that I gave them before we did the footnotes for them and all the numbers were in there. So I had to put a footnote for every one of those numbers. <laughs> Something that, that counts. But this fellow at Grave Distractions published these. And he also did a few other books that I have done. Um, this is the latest one. This is a political book that I wrote back in the 70s when I was um, teaching still. But it's so uh, heavy duty. Um, some of the stuff about the Middle East, the occupied territories, the situation uh, uh, of the, yeah, that's better like that. The situation with the, um, between the Arabs and the Jews. I was living in the occupied territories for three or four years. I know it personally. And uh, I, I wrote a lot of that stuff in this, not about the James or archaeological things, but about political things. So while I was teaching at a university, I couldn't publish this book. Because if you wrote this stuff at that time, you're, you're a dead man. You know? The PC people would come after you, <laughs> the political police or whoever you want to call them. And they'd be making complaints and you'd be uh, like, uh, well, like some of the people at Fox News, I guess. But uh, um, Dee's been reading this. You see, she's gotten three quarters, more than three quarters through it. And she says it's interesting and that uh, it's relevant today as it was back then when I wrote it. So uh, um, I haven't reread it since I wrote it because I hate to read my own stuff. So uh, I'll take her word for it. But I'm pleased to be able to get it out. And he published it and it's just out now. And uh, we've got a few other things from him. This Islamic law, that was my thesis in Palestine Israel. So I was writing there. Some lectures I gave him in, in uh, Malaysia on the Dead Sea Scrolls and the roots of Christianity and Islam. He's done that. And he's, uh, he's done quite a few of the things that I have written. If you don't mind, I got to take something off here. It says too hot. So if you don't mind, I think I'll take, I think I'll take this off. Is that okay with you guys? But I think I'm going to do it like this. This is the thing that is too hot. I'll put the jacket back on. Because <laughs> this thing doesn't need to be on, that's for sure. So put the jacket back on so I look presentable. There we go. Hope I haven't pulled the shirt out and everything else. Now I can look like a, uh, I can look like I'm not, uh, I'm not sweating, I'm not sweating to death. All right, well, that's as far as books go. And some of the things that I have been writing and have written, and I said the James book, uh, Maccabees, Zadokite, Christians, and Shaman, there's another book called um, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, uh, and the Early Christians, a collection of my essays that's really good, and I recommend it. Barnes & Noble has written it. This guy has printed it. And then these guys wrote a book about some of my stuff. I don't know if you recognize these guys. Now, this is Bajan and Lee. Now, you guys who know something about the history of modern books know that Bajan Lee and a guy called Henry Lincoln put a place called Rennes-le-Chateau in southern France on the map as the center of Templar culture and Mary Magdalene tomb and all that sort of thing. And um, that was called, um, what was it called, uh, the, the original book? Um, anyway, that's some of them. But their book, the three of them, was ripped off by uh, the fellow who did the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown, and they sued him, and they lost the case, and they said to have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for legal expenses, his and their own, and so on and so forth. Because, you see, a person can fictionalize a, a book of, um, a book of uh, research. I think it should be in here what their, what their original book was. Uh, I don't see it here, uh, written here, but... Um, uh, the Holy Blood, uh, Holy Blood and Holy Grail. That was what their, what their, their book was. So the Da Vinci Code 
I shouldn't say it. I'll get, uh, I'll get sued by Dan Brown myself now. Uh, really, re really did, uh, really did rip that off if you're familiar with it. And so if you read the original book that made him famous, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And then they wrote this book because Michael Bacon came to Israel, interviewed me, and I introduced him to the subject of the scrolls. He was interested, he'd read my stuff, but then he wanted to write a book with me. So we did a contract and they did this book, but their publishers wouldn't let my name be on the cover because they were known and I was supposedly unknown. <laughs> but there was supposed to be a contract, uh, a parting, uh, 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 one, you know, three for one, in other words, third, third, third. That never even was carried through to its final thing. But I feel sorry for them because after this case with Dan Brown, they were, they died, both of them. Of course, they lost so much money, Bacon lost everything, lost his house and everything. I lost all my royalties from, from this book that I was supposed to get, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to the gory details. Richard Lee drank too much anyway, and he drank himself to death. And the Bacon died from a, a sclerosis of the liver or something to that effect. He had a new liver put in, and so I'm giving you some of the details. But um, the point is that uh, um, this uh, Bacon Lee do appear in the Da Vinci Code. Do appear in the in the Da Vinci Code, and that's what I think they should have sued him as. You know, does it ring a bell? And if that rings a bell, that means I appear in the Da Vinci Code because Dan Brown read our work and his work. Who's the name of the enemy in the Da Vinci Code? Lee Liebig. Lee spelled L E I G H. Because Dan Brown liked to play linguistic tricks. Bajan? Tebing is an acronym of Bajan. Lee Tebing, the enemy in the Da Vinci Code, is Bajan Lee. And who's the hero of the Da Vinci Code? I didn't know this, I saw the movie myself a year or two ago, so I never saw the movie, never cared about it, never read the book. Dr. Robert something, who goes around lecturing on religion and semantics or something like that, I read, oh my God. If Lee if Bacon is here in it, then he's got to be running around in that book too, but I can't believe that. I suggest that 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 hit me and I I'm I if how many have read that book? Because I'm sure you've read that and you haven't read my, my stuff, but the point is or, or or seen the movie. Uh it, it's quite a, a popular movie. So if you haven't, then I didn't even know myself, but I might or possibly am running around in in, in that book somehow. Uh, one last thing I didn't mention are, this is a book of poems that I wrote when I was on the road back at the time of the Beat Generation, uh, 59 to 62, from California to Paris, where I met my wife, all the way to India. And uh, I knew I stayed in the Beat Hotel with the Beat, like those guys, I mean, like those guys on the West Bank in Paris. We didn't like drug addicts. We didn't like... Uh, you know what uh, type of people, and they, they were not acceptable in those days. But their literature, you know, uh, you know Burroughs was the guy who was sitting there all the time. He was a total druggie, and he was uh, uh, sitting downstairs in the hotel. There's pictures of that in this book here of, of that place because uh, I was living there and um, for a time. And here, here, you can't see it from there. But here the woman is who's the patron of that so-called hotel that was uh, Rue Gilles in Paris. And, uh, and uh, she was the patron. And she was a, uh, a Nazi collaborator during the Second World War. And she was something to, to deal with, let me tell you. But she was uh, like Burroughs and all these people were, were enamored of her, obviously. So that's, that's her and that's the Beat Hotel and so on. So I've got uh, some pictures of that kind of thing that may be of interest to you. So those are the things I wrote way back then, but we didn't like those people. And this has nothing like that. And it, or even at that time in the 60s, 61, it expresses an antagonism and an anger because I bumped into those people again in Israel when I was there working on Kippertine and I bumped into like Corso and Ginsburg and all those people. And I bumped into them again when I got to Bombay in India. So we were all going there for different, different purposes. I went and ended up in a synagogue in New Delhi. They went and ended up, you know, studying about, oh, okay. <laughs> I 
I, I saw in the paper the other day that someone stopped a child from ch from choking by saying "Oh, matter" or something like that, or it was on TV. I think it was. You might have seen that that, that thing. It, yes, it is true. It's, yeah, it's really funny. Okay, let's get to what we're talking about. I didn't bore you enough with that. Just saying what some of these books are about, what we've written about in the past. Uh, this one is going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls a, a bit. And maybe lead a little into early Christianity. We don't have time to do the whole thing, but do a bit of it. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found sort of by accident, supposedly, and no one knows the real story. You know, we've heard the stories and it's taken as the truth because they have a scholarly cabal that writes about all this stuff and they all have the same mind. And we call that group the consensus scholars, which we all agree with each other. And um, they're all from major universities like Harvard, Oxford, yeah, you know, you name it, the Sorbonne. Huh? Yeah, oh, right. And these guys are like the Mr. Geniuses, but they have no imagination. They just go the same line. That's how they keep their, their, their tenure and all that kind of stuff. Don't say anything controversial on you, or else you might not, you might not get up the ladder. Uh, you might end up in the <laughs> But the point is that um, the story they all circulated was that a veteran shepherd uh, stumbled on these caves while he was looking for lost sheep near the Dead Sea Scrolls on the side of the cliffside. Uh, of the hills there in the top end of the Dead Sea, if you've been to Israel or Palestine. Um, it, it's, uh, you've been there, haven't you? And, uh, you, know, you can't miss the area. It's a very striking area. Um, I can't see that anyone's grazing sheep around there, but never mind. There was not any grass to graze on, as far as I'm, I am aware. But um, um, that is the story that he went looking for lost sheep and he found these. Uh, these uh, these scroll jars, and that's supposed to be cave one. And in the end, there were about 13 scroll caves found over about a five year period from around 1947 to about 1957 or so. So, those are what are known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, the big, the big, the big catch. I mean, C-A-C-H-E, not C-A-T-C-H, was in a cave called K-4. I don't have any pictures that I can show you here, but if when you're standing in the area where the scroll settlement, they call it Qumran, out of Blackboard, I write it, Q-U-M-R-A-N, that's what they call it now, was, well, there was a settlement that was found there, a ruins of, of a, of cisterns and buildings and a few bathing pools and things of that kind. And so across the wadi from one of them, or about maybe you can see it about 30 meters from where the settlement is, right across one of the outcroppings of, uh, of, of, of land on this cliffside, is where K4 is. You could just climb up there from the wadi below, or you could just walk out and climb down to it. And in there was a huge number of documents, mostly in tattered pieces, not in the scroll jars like Cave One, which were almost complete documents. Cave One had a, a mostly biblical documents uh, and proving that our version of the Bible is very, very old. I agree almost, uh, you know, ninety-eight percent of our version is. Um, is verified by the scrolls of cave one, like Isaiah and things like that. And um, I don't think they had any tip, things that we call original documents, things that the group responsible for these wrote for themselves. But the other caves did. And now there may have been one or two from this cave one. All those scrolls have gone into the Israel Museum. How many have been to the Israel Museum? Well, you go to Jerusalem, you go to the Israel Museum, it's right across from the park. And that is a, it's a huge, it's, it's just a, a huge uh, attraction. If you can see pictures of it. When I first saw it, it looked like the top of an acorn or a mushroom. And the building that they built, and you know, I never realized what they were trying to do. And there's a big black slab next to it. And, and, and uh, uh, in, in, in marble, concrete, whatever. What they were trying to imitate there for this building was 
the top of a scroll jar, just like an egg coming out. And the building in the black block was supposed to be the Bible, the book. I think a black block at the time. That's what the, whoever the architect was was trying to imitate there. So if you've been to Jerusalem, you would see this. And I don't think anyone who's been to Jerusalem hasn't seen this. And if you haven't been there, well, I'm sure you will. When you do go, you will see it. In there are <coughs> mostly the documents from Tatar. But that isn't, it turned out in some of the other caves, one, two, three, four, Four, I said, had uh, maybe a two or three hundred thousand little fragments of pieces, you know, just a huge number, and maybe from about maybe maybe uh, I would say I don't want to over exaggerate, maybe seven hundred to fifteen hundred documents. I don't know, but that doesn't mean they're all different documents. They were multiple copies of the same document, often maybe about seven or fifteen hundred documents, different documents. How do they know they're different? Not that they were different from each other, but different actual manuscripts by handwriting style. They went by handwriting style. So if you get an Isaiah document or a piece of an Isaiah document in 10 different handwriting styles, so you've got, you know, you've got 10 different versions of, you know, 10 different copies of Isaiah there written by different scribes. I mean, you write something and everyone knows your handwriting, right? So that's how these guys began to identify things by handwriting style because they got piecing the things together through recognizing the handwriting style. Then they began dating the handwriting styles in order to date, to date the scrolls. And this is what their official team did in the course of the five or 10 years that they had total control over everything. What I mean, if you don't know the whole story, the best book for telling the whole story of what I'm telling you now is this one here by Dave Cook. Dave Cook, you know, I filled in any of the pieces they didn't know themselves. They knew a lot of them. So this one really does not give you a, an establishment view, view. I would say an opposition view, but it, it, it's the best presentation of the whole story, of the, the discovery and what occurred thereafter, if you're interested. So um, that's why they call it the deception, because there was deception involved in their view. And there, I don't like that title. I thought it should be the Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered, which is the name of another book that I ended up writing. But, um, you know, the publisher wanted something jazzy, so he threw in the word deception. I don't think there was an intentional deception. It was just stupidity. Mostly stupidity uh, from very big name academics. No, big name academics can't be stupid. They're very creative and insightful and full of, and, and, and full of knowledge. Sometimes they're so full of knowledge on a very small subject that it translates as mind. And their mind can't operate too well outside the box. And that's really what happens to some extent, in my view, in the scroll. So I don't think you really have a deception. So let's go back to this thing. One of the biggest documents that was found. And we know that it was there. Just little fragments of it were found in cave four, where I told you all the little bits were piled up in a big heap. You know, you have to sort of dig them out and try to put them together. But a complete document was found in a place called the Cairo Geniza. How many have heard of that? Well, Geniza, you know what that means? Geniza is a Hebrew word having to do with synagogues where they store old documents that have been old prayer books or things like that or maybe letters or things that, that they can't use anymore, but they can't destroy anything with the name of God on it. So they, they can't destroy an old document and throw it in the garbage heap. They have to put it in a Geniza. And the Cairo synagogue was very, very, very old. It goes back to the eight or 900, maybe earlier. And um, when the Crusaders came there, and uh, took over Cairo. I don't think it was that time, but later the British came there in the uh, 1800s, in the late 19th century. Some people found this Geniza, this hidden store place in this old synagogue. And in it was a document called the Damascus Doctrine. And that is a key document. 
uh, they called it the Damascus document because in column six, these are in columns, one, two, you know, Hebrew documents, Hebrew uh, Torah scrolls and things are arranged according to column like this. And they're written on parchment. Uh, they're written as you know from, well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm standing this way, but from your view, they're written from left to right, you know, and, um, Right, yeah, not like that. Right. Uh, well, whatever. My uh, this is my left hand, so left to right, but whatever it is to you guys, you're right to, to where you're reading it. Anyway, they're written the opposite direction that we write. And they're written on individual pieces of parchment that are then sewn together. Usually they get about three or four columns to a piece of parchment. So a Dead Sea Scroll document would be often around 12 or 15 or 16 columns why you'd have about three or four pieces of parchment sewn together and rolled into a scroll, and then you have those you're seeing in synagogues today, those rollers that they take out of the ark. You've seen those, haven't you? Well, that's what the scrolls are. They're, they're, there are no rollers. They're just pieces of parchment, old pieces of parchment that have fallen apart or somehow been like the tape one fairly well preserved. And um, the Damascus document in the Tyre of Geniza, we know from looking at the bits and pieces in cave four, was already known at the time of the writing of the other scroll. And we have almost a full document there in modern, more modern uh, uh, writing, uh, the writing of about the 8th, 9th, 10th century, maybe a little earlier, that somehow got into the Cairo collection of the synagogue around there, 800, 900, 700. And that means they've already discovered scrolls before that time, and I think that they have. People think that Egypt were the first ones, but no, I don't think so. I think that uh, people knew about that. There's some information, people, there's some startling discoveries made in the fourth or fifth century or so that appeared in the Jerusalem markets. We have notices about that in some of the literature. And I think that people had already stumbled on scrolls from the caves and brought them up, tried to sell them there, and this Damascus document probably was one of them. But a form of Judaism did emerge from that. Now, you probably don't know Judaism that well, but a form of Judaism called Karaism, K-A-R-A-I-S-M. And that's a form of Judaism that split away from rabbinic Judaism and still exists to this day mostly in Central Asia, but a lot of moved to Israel, Palestine, area. Uh, I say Palestine, but some are near Nablus and some are down near Tel Aviv. So not a lot of them, but there are Karaites in Israel. And I'm sure if you uh, Google it, you'll find that there's Karaites in the United States as well. And that's a splintered form of Judaism that does not recognize rabbinic tradition, that does not recognize rabbinic tradition. And I am not surprised. It only rec rec recognizes things like Dead Sea Scrolls tradition. There are some indications that they know something about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it already created a, an alternate form then, but I think it, that form, I think that form was already going at that time. And the rabbinic form just got stronger and stronger. So the only form of Judaism we end up knowing is the temples we see Reform Orthodox Conservative, Synagogue Judaism, and so on, based on the Talmud and so on. The Karaites rejected the Talmud out of hand. Out of hand. Uh, uh, that wasn't even in, in the ballpark. And the scrolls would have rejected the Talmud out of hand, I'm sure. That wouldn't even be in the ballpark for them. I don't want to get myself in trouble, you see, but I will repeat that that's true. Scrolls are another form of Judaism, apocalyptic form of Judaism. And how do you know this? Well, read the Damascus document and you'll find out. I thought it's going to tell you where, how it got its name. Well, I think Paul has a vision on the road to Damascus. And the Damascus document mentions Damascus in column six of about a 13 column document. And it says, this is the new covenant that we are going to set up in the land of Damascus. And then it goes on to outline the new covenant in the land of Damascus in the next 
five or eight columns. You following me? You Christians who are of that background in the room know that there's a new covenant in the New Testament. That's where it gets its name from. But your new covenant is this is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Christ. I can read the passages, but I don't have to. Corinthians 1 and the gospel in one form or another. Paul in Corinthians 1. I think the gospel's mimicking Paul because I don't think, um, I think Paul's writing most came before the gospel. And, um, well, I know Jesus never said that. I apologize for that. You know, I, I don't have any feelings, but uh, don't think he ever said such a thing. The new cup, well, he wouldn't have done it because this is a new cup in the blood of Christ. <laughs> but anyway, the point of the matter is, and that's what the New Testament told you somewhat about the last chapter. Uh, uh, elucidate that. Not that James took, right? Am I losing him? The book I said was the New Testament so the stuff I cut out of the James book, second big book. Well, the last chapter in that is the New Covenant. And the, now the New Covenant is mentioned in both, as I said, the last couple of material and the sixth column of the Damascus document. But now here in the land of Damascus, this is what this is why I call it the Damascus, uh, the, 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 new, uh, the, the New Testament. But I really wanted to put the New Covenant first. But I didn't think anyone would follow me what I was talking about, or I knew that if people saw the New Testament, they'd know oh, I'm probably talking about the Christianity covenant. And so the New Testament so it became the title. I wanted to call it the New Covenant first. The same thing, but people don't know about the New Covenant that well. They know about this. So look at the word Damascus. Dom is the first syllable, right? And cup is the last syllable, right? If you know Hebrew, guess what? Now, where does that Damascus come in the Dead Sea Scrolls? This is the new covenant in the land of Damascus. Dom is blood, cup is cup. Dom is blood, cup is cup. So the two are variations on the same thing. And I don't think that the New Testament Paul and his later followers in the gospel writings could have done this by accident. This is a definite reformulation of the new covenant in the land of Damascus. The cup of, the, why would he put, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It's just like too crazy. That's why I wrote the whole book about Leading up to that, I thought that is a great book. No one, nobody reads it, but I think that's the final revelation that would just knock the whole building on its on its pin. Because I think it's a killer understanding of what transpired that the New Testament writers, or Paul and the others who were involved in this, when you look at Paul's letters, is definitely opposed to the Qumran document, absolutely, and. Um, he, in fact, hates them. And everything he says is the very opposite of what you have in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I was telling you that the, these are both apocalyptic movements, the New Covenant sort of New Testament thing, or rather the, the New Testament and Dead Sea Scrolls. But what they're, they're writing about the last days, the last time. The scrolls have a war scroll, a war scroll that scholars have called from the Latin post was the war of the sons of light against the sons of evil. The war of the sons of light against, they're outlining the final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth that they're going to fight. They're going to fight. The scrolls are going to fight. Well, people, the scrolls, consensus, the big academics, and all the famous people, just said, oh, this is an imaginary document. Another famous scholar said from Oxford, this is a, written by a child's exercise uh, uh, document. This, isn't, this couldn't be real. They, they really couldn't think that. But they could achieve that. But they knew that they weren't going to do it by themselves. I got to sit down for my shirt for that reason. I just don't want to forgive me. I hope my shirt isn't going to come out of my, where it's tucked in. But if it is, you're going to have to forgive me that one. It's quite warm. So anyway. So. Um, 
They didn't think they're going to fight this war all by themselves. What did they think? How are they going to win this war against all evil on the earth, against the Roman Empire, against everybody else? How are they going to do that? The holy angels were going to join them in their camp. The holy angels were warrior angels. They weren't just little angels that you look up to with halos around their head, that you throw kisses at and so on. For the scrolls, these were warrior angels. This is the heavenly host. The heavenly host is a military host of, of angelic beings, angelic military beings. They would join the people and Qumran, we call it, in the desert. These are wild documents. Are you seeing how wild they are? These are crazy wild documents, but they're nothing like the New Testament, as we know. But the New Testament is, I think, talking about the school, ripping them off to some extent and reversing them pacifying them. But the scrolls do not say, love your enemy. <laughs> no, 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 that's nice. Of course, right. I like it. I wish I could love my enemy. I don't. I don't think most of you do either. Uh, the scrolls say, hate the sons of the pit. Now, nothing could be more opposite than love your enemy than hate the sons of the pit. And things like that. There's no turn the other cheek in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But there is messiness huge amount of messages and a lot of messianic passages and all the prophecies that we know of the messianic prophecies are in some of their other documents like these ones in the Habakkuk Hesher. Hesher means commentary on the prophet Habakkuk but picking up some of the uh, picking up some of the um, prophetic portions uh, that, that, and explaining them. So Hesher means interpretation in Hebrew. It's Hesher is. It's interpretation is. Uh, I'll just leave it here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I saw what you did. I know. I know. I saw what you did. Over here. Um, so, Hesher means in, this is its interpretation in, in, in Hebrew, interpreting uh, Habakkuk, interpreting Micah, interpreting Hosea, interpreting passages from Isaiah, interpreting all these various things. And it is a very apocalyptic messianic interpretation always. So, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I can't help it. I don't have our notes. I'm just coming it as it comes to me, telling it by looking at papers. The um, consensus people, to go back to them, to hold that thought a moment, whatever I'm at there, I'm talking about the scrolls. The consensus people decided, oh, these were, if you've ever read history, Josephus was a Jewish historian. That was functioning at that time that survived and his works have survived and you can get the collected works of Josephus. I'm sure uh, half of you have heard of Josephus. He wrote uh, uh, several works, an autobiography of himself. He revels in the fact that he's a creep and I'll explain to you why he's a creep. Hey, you don't go around saying any literary uh, superstar is a creep. Well, I do and that's why I get in trouble. And why is he a creep? He's a traitor. And he, he lies about the heritage of the Jews, and he lies about his own prophecies, and he lies about everything else. But there's a lot of good information in, in, in his work about the stuff he didn't really care about. He gets it, he, he, he gives it straight. But if you can look through his uh, lens and fix the distortions, you can get a huge amount of information. So he's got two long works. He's got the antiquities of the Jews, which is just a uh, a Jewish history from the beginning of time to his time. And then he's got a book actually called the Jewish War. You can hear that because he participated in and he betrayed it. I'm going ahead because I don't have a lot of time. And you can do my rest you can fill in by reading my book or other books or your own stuff in history. But um heard of Ben-Hur and got the novel and so, on and so forth. And Ber ben Hur is adopted by the Roman Sea Captain. <laughs> the Roman Sea Captain who saves him from the sea. Uh, and how many have heard of that novel, Ben Hur? It used to be a famous novel, right? So Caesar's is the original Ben Hur. 
he is adopted by the next Roman emperor for services rendered to the next Roman emperor. The, the, the destroyers of Jerusalem and the conquerors of Judea. Vespasian, the Roman general, and his son Titus who destroyed Jerusalem in the temple. And Josephus is adopted into their family and their family line because Nero was killed and he was the last ruler of the city. That's his mouthful. They're called the Flavians. Yeah, I said, I just turned around. How do you mad at me? No, I'm mad at Not at you. Okay. I, I told you I didn't want the damn thing. And I'll make the curse as well, but I can't help you. Anyway, the point of the matter is that they're called the Flavians. You know, in all the works of Josephus, in all the works of Josephus, he's called Flavius Josephus. And why? Because he was adopted into the Roman imperial family of the Flavians, like Ben Hur is as being adopted. Why would a Jewish turncoat trader writer be adopted into the royal imperial family? Because he presented things the way they liked having them presented, that's why. And the Jewish war is presented in the way the Roman emperors to come who conquered Jerusalem wanted themselves presented because Caesar wrote the Gallic War and so on. And they wanted to be presented like Julius Caesar, the new Roman imperial line of slavery. Now, I'm not telling you any secrets, but you wouldn't probably know it just out of the blue either. And so that's why he's called slavery. Why do I call him a traitor? Because he betrayed his people. What happened was he was a young priest. You, you, how can you how write them? How can you survive on them? Because the Flavians supported him. He was sent up to Galilee. Galilee, yeah, Galilee. That's why the New Testament knows so much about Galilee, because Josephus documents it all in his secret. Otherwise, they wouldn't have all that data. That's why Jesus comes from there and walks around there and does all those things, because they have all that data in Rome after Josephus is writing. And they're writing this stuff. Don't hurt the thing. That's how I see it. I can't help it. And um, he is commanding the different resistance posts in Galilee. And Vespasian, the Roman general, has been called in from Britain by the various year of the three emperors, which is in Rome. I forget the names of the other two emperors after the Nero. So there were two more coming. And they're still there, Jose, in one way or, or another. So it's called the year of the Emperors. It's the year of the Jewish Revolt, 66, 67, and so forth. Roman troops are coming down through Galilee to put down the uprising that's taking place in the temple. The Sebas are up there in Galilee in command of the resistance forces. And um, he's in this, I can't, my brain isn't good used to this old thing in my book from here. He's in one of these uh, um, town forts. I don't think it's just water, but maybe one of those one of those places. Uh, he's in one of those places, and um, he uh, everyone you know is killed or is being killed, and he surrenders. He's in a cave actually above this. It's more towards the, the Golan Heights and present day Nazareth. Uh, so that's down in the south of Florida. Anyway, the point of the matter is that he. Um, Surrenders to three people. And the point is that in this cave, I don't have it all right, you'll read it. In this deep is he's proud of They're hiding out in this cave, he and I guess two brothers, and they draw straws. That's right, I got it wrong. They draw straws. He decides it. Who will kill the other two and then kill himself? That's what they were all supposed to do, commit suicide. And he proudly proclaims the Caesar drew the short straw. He probably fixed it, whatever he did. Anyway, that's what happens. Yeah, he does. He kills the other two, and then he goes out and surrenders. And in going out and in, uh, in, in surrender, he gives the world ruler prophecy that the, that the Messiah is based on a world ruler would come out of Palestine, a uh, Messiah to rule the world, in Numbers 24 or something or other. And uh, he proclaims Vespasian, the Messiah, that was that was uh, to come and first prophesied in the Old Testament that was to come out of Palestine to rule the world. He's the first person to apply the mess messianic prophecy to anybody. 
prescriptions have gone to file your Messianic prophecy to Jesus. It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls too, but the, uh, but the interpretation of it there is very complicated and I would have to have it in front of me to describe it to you. So that's how Josephus gets into the Roman imperial train. From that moment on, he's an interrogator of prisoners. And this is the beautiful part. He's so proud of himself. He's such a, he's such a, he's such a creep. The Romans are besieging Jerusalem. By this time, Vespasian has gone back to because of the uprisings in Rome, the other three emperors, and that's claiming him emperor in, in, in Rome, the beginning of the Flavian family. And he's left his son Titus in charge of the siege of Jerusalem. And Josephus goes out and his dreams are resisting on the wall. And he, since he speaks Hebrew and everything, he proclaims, you know, he asks them, he's going out there to yell up to the defenders on the wall to surrender to the Romans. I don't know if he's using the terms or what he's giving them, but he's yelling, yelling this out. This is all in his autobiography. He, 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 he writes this very, very proudly. And he says that one of the defenders on the wall took a sling and 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 and, run and threw it and hit him on the head. Josephus, this is so accurate, hit him on the head, almost killing him. And Josephus fell down in a swoon. That's how popular he was. And a huge cheer went up from the people on the wall. <laughs> and then Josephus, I think, had something like, but they were wrong. Their enemy Josephus was not dead. He's proud that he that he's that he's hit by the revolutionaries in Jerusalem, whom he's betrayed. And from then on, all of his writings are one huge betrayal and one huge glorification of the, of the Flavian family. And that's why they survive today, but they're still full, full of huge amount of that, including the autobiography, including the Jewish war, and you know, stuff that it has no reason to, uh, to falsify, he does. Now, I told you to take me back, and I forget where I told you to take me back to before I got on to Josephus. And uh, uh, it was something of the last, yeah. Yeah, I suppose it was the, 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 the cup of the new covenant in, in my blood, but there's more to it than that. Uh, in any case, I'm not doing well on that one. I, said, I knew I would forget. I should have told you then, but, but I did forget. In any case, uh, the rest of the Damascus document, the new covenant is just a reaffirmation of the old, of the old, of the old covenant. Not like the Christianity, you know, but a reaffirmation of the old covenant. And they're going to set up their camps. I guess that's what I'm talking about. Josephus telling us about the revolutionary movement. Their camps, and I said that we had the war scroll, that they were going to, you know, that they were going to be joined by the heavenly angels in their camps. I guess talking about their camps that I'm interested in. The camps were spread out in the land of Damascus, according to them. That's the scrolls now. Damascus document and a few other community rules, some other ones. And this is crazy stuff, but really interesting. These camps have to be perfectly pure. That's according to them. There could be no impurity in their camps. This is the scrolls. The scrolls are crazy wide. I know I was going to get to the Essene theory. I've got let me get to the Essene theory after this. Remind me something to that. If that was then, I'm going to probably say a few more things and try to draw down to a close it in some way because there's so much data here. You know, I can stand on my head for eight hours and, 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 and give it to you. This stuff is just wild. Unexplained to people, unpresented, and just like mind boggling. What the scholars did to it turn into so unimportant to show, and I'll explain to you how they managed to do it by not relating it to the first century. That's how they did it by sticking it all in the second century BC through their handwriting lines. They said, I will get back to their little game uh, when I finish. But this stuff does not relate to the second century BC. If you read the documents, any shape or form, but they didn't read the documents. What they look at, I told you to put the documents together. The handwriting. And then they use independent analysis to date the handwriting. No, don't use independent analysis to date the handwriting. You can if you want. Read the bloody, use the expression documents. I dare say anything worse to kill, kill me. So uh, <laughs> read the documents. That's all you have to do. 
So they were setting up camps in the land of Damascus that no impurity. Why could no impurity? No women, no sexual activity, nothing like that. But the uh, heavenly angels apparently could not abide human impurity. And they wanted the heavenly angels to come back down to their camp and fight with them and go back up to heaven. They couldn't go back up to heaven if they encountered human impurity like that. And I don't know how they got this idea. They're very imaginative. I didn't learn from that. This is where they dug this one out. But that's what they thought. So that in the camps was utter purity. And the scrolls are about the utter purity necessary for the camps. But what are they preparing for? It's the final ultimate war against all evil on the earth, which we know they lost <laughs> in the war against Rome. <clears throat> and everybody was killed, which is why no one came back to retrieve the documents. And probably most of the ones that did survive committed suicide on Masada. I don't have to go into all that because not, not, not many of you have heard of the mass suicide on Masada. They were supposed to uh, commit suicide rather than be taken prisoner, and they all did with their families. You people, Josephus, uh, Josephus loves the Shrider and Masada because that's how we all know about Masada is Josephus. And so it was valuable information. You, know, you have to give him, give him that credit. So in these camps, there could be no human impurity. And these camps are preparing for this final apocalyptic war against all evil that is outlined in the war scroll. And it's not an imaginary document. There may be crazy people written by crazy people, but it's not imaginary. It's real. It's what they actually saw. And it's not a child's game. It's a really, a really mind-bogglingly exciting, you know, intellectual effort that explains you the whole way they were thinking at that time. And because of the, all the Messianic references in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is where I was getting to Josephus. He tells us about the different sects as well. That's how we know about them. We'll call them sects whatever you want. Essenes, you may have heard of them. Pharisees, Sadducees, and Zealots, etc. The Zealots are the ones supposed to be the, who, who carried out the war. Even in the Gospels, one of Jesus' followers is Judas the Zealot, remember? Uh, and even in the letters of Paul, or in the book of Acts when James, Paul comes up to see James. James says, Paul, what you see, Paul, we are all zealots here, all zealots of the law, Acts 21, 21, which is an authentic part of Acts. It's in, from the we document. I can't separate it all for you now, but you, 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 my folks can look and see. Acts has two parts. The first two-thirds is he, she, they, third person. The last part is based on a diary of some kind, and that's not full of supernatural acts and different miraculous happenings. It's down to earth. We went here, we went there, we saw this. We went up to, to Jerusalem, and guess who? We saw in 2121, James, the brother of the Lord. James, the brother of Jesus. Well, we thought James was already dead. We could only turn out James we ever knew in the Gospels was James, the brother of John. Oh, that's a little fudge, dears. That's a little fudge, because he's not dead. It's not James, the brother. John may have had a brother called James, but he was totally unimportant. And the pilgrimage of Santiago de Compostela that some of the people about earlier today is not to that James. It's to James, the brother of Jesus, but they don't even know it in Compostela, but that's another thing that's beyond our, beyond our uh, worthy view in a short time. What time are we at? What time is it? Huh? Oh, okay. So we, we, have, we have some more time. All right, so... Yeah, I don't have a watch, and I don't have anything in front of me that, that, that is showing me the time. So, okay. So, anyway, um, Josephus gives these various sects, and as I said, zealots are mentioned in the, in the Gospels and so on and so forth, and uh, James' followers are called zealots in the, gospel, in, in the Book of Acts, which is an authentic part. That's why I'm trying to emphasize that from Acts uh, 16 onwards. James's instructions to overseas communities. We don't even know who James is in the book of Acts. He's never introduced to us. You know, all the others are killed or other in Acts or, uh, you know, and so on. And suddenly this James, the brother of Jesus, pops up and he's giving instructions to overseas communities to abstain from blood, things sacrificed to idols, fornication, and I forget the last thing. Uh, it's in Acts 16. And then in Acts 21, it's repeated, where Paul explains what, you know, what he was told by James to tell overseas communities when he went to places like Galatia and places like that, changing instructions to overseas communities. 
Homer exchange is not dead in the 50s at all. He doesn't die until 62 when he's killed in a weird way, but I can't go into it that, that, at the moment. That's only my James brother of Jesus. But the point is, he's the leader of the church. He's the leader of the church at the end of Acts. Peter is answerable to him. Paul is answerable to him, but Paul doesn't like him. In Galatians, he says, oh, these so-called leaders, these people who think they're, they're super apostles, not that they're important means anything to me. How many of you have read Galatians chapter 2 and seen that passage? Yeah, well, it's there. And he's a nasty piece of work. And he says nasty things like that. And he'd be the worst person to have in your movement. He wouldn't do anything you said. And he would do everything of opposite of what you said if he didn't like it. And that's what he did. He did not do what he was instructed to do. So in this interview in Acts, when he's been raising a lot of money, he's got raised a lot of money so he can be welcome in Jerusalem so that they would think that, okay, success. So he comes up there, and James says, but you see, Paul, that's his Acts now, an actual quote in the we document, first, third person. But you see, Paul, we have heard that everywhere in Asia, you teach against the people, against the law, and against the temple this place. And that's exactly what he's doing. That's exactly what he's doing, and James knows it. Paul hates James. The actual James. How would I know that? Look at Romans. He says, some people are so weak, they'll eat only vegetables. But we consider vegetarians to be strong. And the reason that these people like James are eating only vegetables, we know that from other church documents, is because to keep their ritual purity. So they don't, in, in, uh, by, in some accident, you know, do in, have some infraction on the ritual purity situation. Not that I believe that that's something you have to do, but that's what they believed, so the holy angels would join their camps. It all makes sense if you know the whole scope of what's going on here, which you don't know because they don't tell you, and they don't tell us. They never told me, that's for sure. So anyway, so James says to Paul, he's a quote in Acts from the wee document when Acts gets legitimate, from probably a Lucan diary of some kind. Changes from third person to first person, an error. So you know it's a different error. And said, so go into the temple to show there's no truth to the rumors we have heard. And because he's conceived, conceived of having money, you know this passage, right? We have some people under Nazarite oath here. Nazarite oath, Christians. This is a very peculiar, specific Jewish oath. A very unique one. I don't even know all the aspects. There's a temporary Nazarite oath and a lifelong Nazarite oath. And I'm sure they took the word Naz Nazarene, Nazarene from all that. Not from Nazareth. But in any case, whatever. Because they were called Nazareans and all that sort of thing. But it's too complicated to go into and too complicated to prove. But you when you think about it, you'll see that Nazareth is not where Jesus came from or was born or anything like that. That's just what the Gospels want to present. And they don't want to talk about Nazarite oaths and things like that or being or Nazaritism or anything like that. We have four people under, obviously, a temporary Nazarite oath, which cost some money in the temple. There's some procedures you're supposed to do. And in that time, I think you um, you fasted. And you didn't cut your hair. And so on and so forth. And then after you paid the expenses and the note was presented, then you were allowed to cut your hair. Under this temporary Nazarite oath situation. And pay for the expenses concerning that. Well, here's Paul. He's not supposed to be for the law. He's, uh, the law brings death, he says in some of his letters, doesn't he? The law is a curse. He's saying, okay, James, I'll go in and do anything you want. Yeah, I'll pay for the expenses of these people under this obscure part of Nazareth. Oh, that's what happens when you put the back, you put the back shampoo, right? And what happens to him when he goes into the temple? He says, you know, after, after James already tells him that he's heard, all these things about him, about the rumors that we know are true, to prove that they're not true. He's going to prove that they're not true. But he doesn't prove it against the law, against the temple, against the people. He goes in to, to do this, and what happens to him? He's mobbed. He's mobbed by the people who recognize him, and he brings some Gentiles in with him. Now, not against Gentiles, but they didn't want Gentiles in their, in their precincts. Yeah, and, and, and they yell, this is the man! 
who teaches against our people all over you know, the same things that James said, but in a slightly different version of it. And, and it's quoted in Acts, and he's mocked. And they take him, and they want to close the door behind him. That's actually a passage in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They close the door behind him. They want to close the, 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 the door behind him. And then Roman soldiers who are in the Antonius Fortress, if you remember, are looking down, and they come down, and they rescue Paul from the mob. Well, this is obviously prearranged by Paul. Or he wouldn't have gone in under any other circumstances. Not now. Not all. That's a Roman citizen for a time. Oh, I know you know why. I think some of you know, so I won't get out the answer. But, you know, how did Paul have a Roman citizenship? Why did Paul have one this most? He didn't have Roman citizenships. How come he was in so important? So he pulls out his Roman citizenship. What? You're going to kill Roma, uh, Romans, you're going to do this to Romans, etc. And the Roman soldiers are standing there with him and they make the crowd listen to his future of, of, of this. It's in Acts 22, it says. And then they take him under armed escort down to Caesarea. You remember all that? And from there they keep him for a while, question him a while. There's some questioning that goes on there with him and the Herodians and so on and so forth. And then ultimately he's sent to Rome, supposedly, to be tried. But when he Get to Rome. He acts as nobody knew why he was sent there or what he was doing there. And that's where Acts ends. But Acts doesn't know the outcome of further things. It's not a belief. There are people who say, well, Paul was killed in Rome. Oh, no, I don't think he was killed in Rome. I think he returned to Palestine. And there are some things that are about a foul of Saulus and Paul in Josephus. And this Saulus is a member of the, of the Herodian family. Now, if you're a member of the Herodian royal family, and they had governorship in Cilicia and Turkey and Anatolia and northern Syria and places like that under Roman supervision, you would have a Roman citizenship and a Roman passport, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think Paul got his citizenship and passport because he was an Herodian. And lo and behold, in the book of Acts, in the Romans book, if you know your Romans, he sends greetings at the end of Romans, remember? And he said, he sends greetings to so-and-so. My memory is as good as it used to be. I can read it to you, but I don't know if I got it. Okay. Send greetings to so-and-so, send greetings to so-and-so. And he mentions some Herodian name. And then he says, oh, he says, my kinsman, my kinsman. And he mentions a Herodian name. I can't remember his name. Yet. And then he said, and then send greetings to my littlest kinsman, my kinsman, uh, Herodion, H-E-R-O-D-I-O-N, which means the littlest girl or the youngest girl. So he admits there he's a Herodian, if you will. He is related to Herodian family. Now, that's not proof positive, but that's proof pretty positive. To me, that's good enough, so people don't want to take that. That's their business. I've written a whole article about that. It's on my website, robertisenman.com. Paul as Herodian. So, and it's in all my books and so on that I try to go through why we were thinking, oh, well, when I speak of, now when I think of Paul as a Herodian, then I get the whole picture. There were Herodians in Rome who had left after the uprising. There were people in the Roman entourage there, and they knew Josephus, and Paul would have met Josephus in Rome, and in fact, Philippians <laughs> speaks of one individual there. Um, what's his name? Um, uh, Epaphroditus. See, my brain's good. Thank God. Epaphroditus, who's Paul's fellow apostle and comrade in arms, as he calls him in chapter 2, I think it's what he said later. He sends Epaphroditus to Rome with some letters to the Christians in Rome, Christian community in Rome. This is, I would say, um, oh, maybe in the late 50s, early 60s. Guess what? Epaphroditus is turned into Nero's secretary for Greek letters. How many Epaphroditus were there in the world and world at that time? I don't think that many. And I don't think it's back when he turns into Nero's secretary for his letters. And then when Nero is killed, Guess what? He becomes Vespasian's secretary for something of the same kind of thing. And 
Who does this Caesar dedicate all of his works to? Ha ha ha! Epaphroditus, as the state. Epaphroditus, my, my, this is the Pauline Epaphroditus. And they're all working together. And this is what we owe the literature that we have now. This is the people we owe it to. I don't know which is the people you wrote. There are several that wrote into Rome, Agrippa II, his wife, I mean, his sister, Bernice, who was Titus's mistress, and all kinds of things like that. There are all sorts of things that my brain doesn't keep in, in but I, I mentioned in, in my book. But there's plenty of people that were here in Rome, including Epaphroditus and Josephus, and a lot of others who could do some good creative writing. Some good creative writing around a Pacific question. A Pacific non non anti Roman question. One who rather is anti Jewish and pro Roman. You know, turning the Jewish messianic messiah into a pro Roman peace lover. Which is nice. I'm not against being a peace lover. You're welcome to be a peace lover. I'm just telling you. The, the, the ambience to which I think we owe the documents that we have survived 2,000 years ago. The documents, not so much false letters, but the Gospels are quite beautiful things. And beautiful literature does survive. Uh, you know, Odysseus survived. Homer's work has survived. Greek tragedy has survived, and so on. Literature is always more attractive than history. Literature, I had a professor tell me at college was was truer than history. Yeah, literature is easy to relate to. History is hard, I should say. History is nuts and false, difficult, I think. So you have to evaluate that yourselves. I can't be the final arbiter of that. But the point is that um, these are the people we are dealing with. So let's go back to this scroll community and stuff. I call the scroll community. Scholars call them what? Essays. I'll tell you why, because it proceeds that's why I went so deep in Josephus. Because of his description of the sex. And they got it all wrong. Because Josephus' description of the sex is nothing like the essays and the documents that we have. So if we are if, if they're not essays, they're something else. I call the literature we have the literature of the messianic movement of Palestine. Or for the word. I don't want to get silly with that. The literature of the messianic movement in Palestine, the real messianic movement, not the pseudo one that was created in Rome and Alexandria, and that these documents are only written in Greek and no Hebrew exemplar has ever been found for any of them. This is the real messianic movement, and what happened is they were all killed or committed suicide. I'm sorry, that makes me angry. I'm so angry. I get so angry because I know that they were all killed. And I know that they all committed suicide. I know they were the bravest people on earth. And that's why I get emotional and worked up about the whole thing that has happened and transformed and done to what their Dead Sea Scrolls documents that are found on the site. And these people all killed themselves and their families and committed suicide rather than surrender to Rome. And then there's this turncoat, low life con man writing all this anti Semitic stuff surviving for 2,000 years, and they all die. Fortunately, the documents didn't die, but then got the scholars who made them die again through their interpretation. I guess I'm losing one. Right? So the point is, <laughs> I'm angry to take note, but I guess I'm the one that to talk about this stuff. So how come this happened? Back to Josephus. Back to Josephus. Essie, Sassy, the, the, uh, and uh, Pharisee. Okay, well, we all know Pharisees were collaborated with Rome and were sort of an establishment group, but weren't part of the priesthood. The Sadducees were, the dog was David's high priest, so they pulled out because they were the high priesthood and so on and so forth. No distinction made between Herodian high priest and Maccabean high priest by this Josephus categorization. Oh, yeah. Qumran are Sadducees. They call themselves sons of that dog. They do in the documents. They are Sadducees, but they are messianic Sadducees. Not the turncoat, what I would call Herodian Sadducees, were introduced to in the New Testament. Got what I'm talking about? 
We have status. Just like everything else, we have two groups of status. An oppositioning group and an establishment group. And the only group we have in the New Testament are the establishment awaiting status. The priests for Herod and his family appointed. Where are the opposition Sadducees? At King Knox. That's where they are. And that's where you never read any establishment scholarly documents. Caesar and Eskin. Yeah, Caesar and Eskin. Yeah, seems we're peace loving and so on and so forth. But that seems we're basically, what the seeds was going, that seems are basically tyrants. But there was another historian that had a different facetious in the second century in Rome. His name, I haven't put it in there, I'm trying to think it out here. His name was Hippolytus, H I P P O L Y T U S. I can still spell it. Hippolytus. And he has a different version of Josephus in his work. He quotes him. And he says, Josephus says, I guess he, he attributes to a different version, maybe an Asian version or something. There were four groups. There were four groups of Essenes, the ones that we were just talking about, the normative Essenes. Then there was another group of marrying Essenes or something. And then he quotes two others. Zealot Essenes and Sicari Essenes. Zealot Essenes and Sicari Essenes. And he describes that there were Zealot Essenes would kill anyone they heard discussing the law who was not circumcised. They were forcible circumcised. I mean, this is all what went into the Exodus. I'm not advocating this. I'm just telling you this is what, what was going on. It's not attractive, I admit. The Gospels are much more attractive. This is nasty stuff. I, don't, I, I, I admit it. I'm not preaching religion here. I'm just trying to do some history. And, uh, you know, and it's up to you if you care about it. It's nice if you live in a dream world. And in a dream world, all life is beautiful and you don't have to have any trouble. But if you don't want to live in that dream world and you like history and you want to know what really happened, I think I'm going to give you some data that can be helpful. I won't say it's the final word, but it can be very helpful. So he says they kill anyone they hear discussing the law who is not circumcised. Well, these are not any Essenes we ever heard of. And these are not, you know, so when <laughs> they are the Essenes that come run, if they're Zealot Essenes, i.e. they're Zealots, this is Zealot living, living way back in the other day. And one of them, the Masters Doctrine, used Zealots, Zealots for the law in the very first, in the very first column. These are not, you know, these are not the Essenes that our scholars decided they were. What? Tacitus Essenes wrote the war scroll, the final apocalypse of the war against the Legion? No, sorry. Son, the sons of light against the sons of darkness and so on? No, no, I'm sorry. They didn't. They didn't. And then the Sicari Essenes. Who are the Sicari? Well, you know Sicari. Have you ever heard of Judas Iscariot? He's been transferred too, transformed too. He's the betrayer of Christ, right? Isn't he the one that kisses Jesus on the cheek and has him turned over to the Romans, as far as I recall? Isn't that who Judas Iscariot is? I don't know. Yeah, that's based on Judas Iscariot. It's not a real person. There was a Judas. But who, is, who were the Sicarii? It's the Roman word for the revolutionary. And why were they called Sicarii? Because the Roman word for short and not is Sica. The Latin word apparently. You know the Arabs carry around the, on their garments a curved little knife to this day? I'm sure that's what their sequel was like. It's a little knife like sword dagger that the Arabs still carry today around their around their chest or on their you know. Huh? Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> it isn't a game though. It's it, it's for real. You can cut someone's head off with that. And the point of the matter is. The point of the matter is, these Sicarii were the ones called Sicarii because of they were assassinating pro Roman stooges in Jerusalem in the period leading up to the war against Rome, assassinating priests and things like that. And the Romans applied the word Sicarii to them knife people, dagger people, assassins. It's a synonym for assassins, in the summer, the effect of assassins. And so Josephus, back to our boy again. He's got some good information. He tells us about Masada. We know all about the suicide and everything else. 
And he tells us who were, the, I tell you, the people on Masada were largely from Qumran, and we found some undocumented on that. The Sifa says, who are they? The Sikari. So he's confirming what I'm saying in a different style, but not that anybody would know. These, these are nasty people. They deserve to commit suicide. They're just terrorists. They're just horrible people. They're killing people. They're the nice people. That's why you know they committed suicide. That's why the Romans wanted them and so on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He undermines their assassination with the fact that they are Sikari, the terrorists. Yeah, so for me, they're not the terrorists. They're the people preparing for the final apocalyptic war against the Roman world. They're, they're, they're the people in the desert camp allowing no impurity in the desert camp. They're the people that launched the war against Rome. They're the people that launched the messianic movement. And, you know, that's what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So our Gallican scholars have told everyone these are Essenes. But nobody reads the documents. So they can get away with murder like that. If no one reads the documents, if no one in Christianity reads Paul, but just reads the Gospels, we're home free. Ah, but if you start reading the end of Acts and Paul, you may not be home free. If you just read the uh, if you just uh, read the scholars and don't read the documents, as far as the Dead Scrolls go, oh yeah, these are Essenes. Yeah, these are Essenes were in the wilderness. They were they were in these places. That's an Essene establishment there. These are Essene documents. Oh, those are Essene documents. I'll be uh, turtle dove. They're not. So-called SAR documents, and they are what? Like the Holocaust documents. The Kari Zella Essene documents, which are speaking. I can just throw the word Essene away, which means purity or something like that. And just stick with the word Zella Sikari, Messianic. And that's what the scrolls are, and they're a totally different messianic movement than what we are preaching. And uh, that's what my books are are about. And that's why I think it's so important to know about the new covenant in the land of the night. The Last Supper, the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Why would anyone, why put the cup? Why not say, this is the new covenant in my blood? Why put the cup? Because it's in the Damascus covenant, that's why. And so on and so forth. If we're making it into drinking blood, something who's absolutely for pay would never do what even a human blood I would drink any blood at all. It's the total opposite of Judaism. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. You know, I know I sound nuts, but it makes me angry, see? And most people, oh, oh I would say 100 billion people think, I know. That's fine. But 100 billion people have been calm into thinking something like this is possible and it's not possible. Jews would never drink the blood at that period of anything, certainly not human blood. I know that in Christianity just said a symbolic ritual service, but there they were actually supposedly doing it on Passover. I, I, I can't go into the story, but I, you know, it, it, it makes, it's, it's a lovely story and I don't want to hurt, you know, the beautiful stories I hate the Jews who admit it, but whatever you want to call them, but, you know, it is a beautiful story piece of literature, but it's not history. And it's the very opposite of what happened in Palestine, unfortunately, I think. And um, so these camps in the northern Syria, turns out that Paul is being sent up to one of these cities. Now there's some more disinformation in the Christian material that you're all familiar with, but you're not, you're not I got a little longer than I'll let you go. You're not familiar with. And that is Antioch. You're not told that there's four Antiochs in the Seleucid world. Who are the Seleucids? I'm not even told who they are. The Seleucids are the Greco, uh, whatever you want, Asian rulers of those areas after Alexander. Uh, Seleucus was out in one of Alexander's generals who got that area and they set up a kingship that the Maccabees fought against. So there were, they founded four Antiochs, which one of their first, uh, the father of the first Seleucids was, was known as Antiochus. But it isn't just one. We think Antioch is on the Lebanon coast, and they're fighting about it right now uh, in the war with the, with the um, Syrians and Lebanese and uh, Russians, uh, Persians, and et cetera, et cetera, Turks, and so on, right there between Lebanon and Turkey. 
And that's what we think Paul went to when he first comes. That's what we think. There was another Antioch. There are two others. One at the bottom of the Euphrates. Today's Basra was known as Antioch. One in Asia Minor, I think he even refers to it in the but even more important was the one at the top of the Euphrates that was called Antioch by Kalirho. It's in southern Turkey now, but it was in northern Syria back then. It was at the source of the Euphrates River. Very important Antioch. There's a whole kingdom, Comagina, around that place. And that's where the Jamesian community had a strong foothold. And that's where Paul is traveling. And that's where he is when he recites that conversation in, in Galatians. When James' messenger came down to Antioch, blah, 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 I, I, you know, I, I, I uh, addressed them to their face and blah, blah, blah. I forget what, it, what, what he said there about his disagreement with James' message. It's the Antioch in northern Syria. That's where the Dead Sea Scroll people were establishing their camps in the land of Damascus. They call that whole area north and east of Damascus, the land of Damascus. That's where they were spread out. That's where they were preparing themselves. And that's where all these things were going on. I, 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 I cover that in my James Brother and Sister thing. I cover the messages that have been sent up to Antioch. And that uh, city is in southern Turkey now. I think it's called, um, what? Yeah, no, but what's it called? No, no, it has a name. Oh, God, um, uh, uh, it's in my brain. Anyway, it'll come to me. Anyway, the point is, so that's what, I, what we just told them. That's like the little answer on the line to that. But there is a, an actual name in Turkey now for it. Uh, but uh, I don't remember the name of it. Anyway, that's where things were happening. And there's a lot of material about that that's interesting that you have to read with your people carefully. Read my book carefully. The confrontations were taking place there. The Jamesian community was there. There was, a, there was a king from that community that came down and participated in the war against Rome with, with the Jews and was killed. Uh, I, I dedicate my uh, James book to them. Mona Bassett, his name was. He was uh, a king from that territory. He took part in the beginning of the uprising. He was killed fighting the Romans, et cetera, so he had help from that area. And a lot of stuff we need to do, but I think that's enough for tonight. Thank you very much for your time, patience, and my negativity. Well, thanks for inviting me, too. I mean, you know, one way to come, one way to bore people, and it's really not for nothing. Any quick questions? Because we have a little time left before we let people go, and I don't uh, want to uh, do anything else. But tomorrow yeah. we'll be here. We can talk. Yeah, where, where do you get all the uh, Buddha. Uh, Buddha. Buddha. Oh, thanks, man. I, I, uh -oh. I don't think I did very well, but I started out good, but you can't ever end because there's so much more to, to say. And uh, you do you do good for three quarters, and then you start going to pieces because there's other stuff. But thanks a lot for the time. Anything else that you want to ask about that? I do. Yeah, go ahead. So how do you reconcile today's world, today's Damascus, with the history that you Well, so how do we apply that to today's news here and there? Yes, even our today's world is a big world. That's why I wrote this book here. I, I, I talk about today's critical things with war, territory, and, uh, and nation. Uh, I'll sit down now, uh, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, No, love your enemy. Well, well, love your neighbors in the you, Ten Commandments. Love our neighbor, but we do. And, and a lot of times we are in support of our enemy. We have our neighbors. Well, you can, you can love whoever you want, and that's several creatures that I'm not against what you love. But I'm not against, I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, in love with anything Paul had a hand in, in um, creating. I have to just say that right from the get go. To me, this is 
a person on the level of Josephus, an arch traitor, uh, a person who betrayed his people, a person who says disgusting, intolerable, untrue things about his people, about the law, about Moses, about everything else. And therefore, you can love Christ. Because as I said, it's a beautiful picture that's presented of him in the Gospels. But the point of the matter is, I can't, I, 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 you know, you, you, you choose to ignore all the other things that are running around and that create what we now know as anti-Semitism. And that's why we've had anti-Semitism for the last 2,000 years. It has a theological underpinning that will not go away. The Jews can be the sweetest people in the world and they're going to be hated because they killed Christ, don't you know? And then, of course, they, even though six million have already perished in the most horrendous way possible, there's more going on and more happening and more happening and more happening and can never be left alone. So whatever your love is, these threats that are involved in this love to me are the form of a horrendous form of hatred and I can't, I can't deal with it. So as far as Damascus goes, we're talking about an ancient situation that has nothing to do with Damascus city itself. It's a, Paul was on the road to Damascus. There was a community there who was going to visit. It wasn't a political statement. And they strolled and up. They're talking about an area that's called this because that's the main city. And they're talking about the area beyond that and so on. So nothing to do with the political situation, nothing to do with today, and nothing to do with today's world, nothing to do with the coming of Islam that now dominates exactly almost a, a half of the world's population and has the uh, has doctrines so come diametrically opposed to the Christ you love that you wouldn't even be able to uh, to deal with it. And, uh, you know, the world is uh, never going to be uh, cured of any of these things. Maybe your love will help it, but uh, the world is going to be done the way it is long after you and I are gone. And I don't think any belief or, or doctrine is going to save it. And I don't think it's going to be saved, quite frankly, from the mess it's in. It's going to stay a huge mess after as we live and after we're gone. But that's just my answer. I just don't think anything we think or believe is going to save the world, period, one way or the other. Your question, yeah. I don't know. I, oh, you know, Isaiah's Isaiah is like about well, six, seven hundred BC or something. Part of it is earlier, something later. But uh, we don't know. The later part was tacked on in the four, four, five hundred years. So we don't know, uh, you know, what uh, Damascus uh, occurred. But maybe it did end up at one time in a heap of ruins and was and was rebuilt. I don't. I, I wouldn't be able to speculate on what happened between six hundred BC and uh, like uh, two hundred BC. I don't even know what happened to it under the Seleucids. I don't know what, whether the Romans built it up again. I, I don't know what the history of Damascus. You'd have to look at the history, archaeological history of Damascus. But um, I don't think Damascus is the center of our issue because I think Damascus for the scrolls and for Christianity, because Paul's on the road to Damascus. Well, that's a, that's a good one. You know, he's not on the road to Damascus. He's on the road to northern Syria. But anyway, there's a community in Damascus that may have been on the road when he gets to Syria. And so on. Uh, but uh, the point being that uh, Damascus, politically speaking, wasn't very important at that time. But it was an area that was uh, called by, by that name, like we call it Syria. Did they call it Syria then? I, I suppose some people could, might have called it Syria then, but I, I don't know much about what Damascus did or would have it ended up in ruins or not. Well, Well, you know, everyone's anti Semite is another person's neighbor. And uh, <laughs> I just have to look at some of the things he says about, about Jews and things, and you might get a feeling that he's a little bit. Uh, a Rhodian. He's an Rhodian. He's an Rhodian. He's not. Rhodians are not Jews. They're not Jews. Not, some mixture, to say, forcibly married to Maccabean. But they're, they, they're, they're from that area in near Gaza today and also in Transjordan, Idumeans, uh, Edomites. They're actually Edomites. Uh, and they come in under Roman sponsorship after the Maccabeans are destroyed by uh, the Syrians and the, and the Romans. They destroy the Maccabean family. Uh, Judas is killed in the way we know in the wars, but later on the rest of the Maccabees are killed. 
notice you have to read your Josephus. Josephus has it all in there, uh, in, in the background to the Jewish war and in the antiquities. And then slowly, slowly, these Herodians come in, the, the Romans, they're a pro-Roman family, and they introduce them as, 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 uh, as king of the Jews. But to be a king of the Jews, you didn't have to be a Jew. To be a king of the Jews would be like a king of the Armenians, king of the Bolivians, whatever. It was a, a national grouping that the Romans had as part of their empire, and they could put anyone they wanted in this thing. That's been, but we think of them as Jewish. They were Judaized. And maybe Paul was, but I don't think Herod was, uh, you know, Herod killed so many Jews, you couldn't count them all. And uh, it, it a, someone said, you should like Herod. Uh, to me, Herod is, you know, way up there with uh, some of the worst, worst terrorist, killer, vicious people of all time. Uh, someone objected in, on my web page or my uh, Facebook to the fact that uh, I, I, I compared Herod, Herod to Hitler. And I still would compare Herod to Hitler. That's what people say. Yeah. Well, where he got his visions. Why is he, why is he only the, I don't know if he ever really was. Well, Whose I'm testimony sure. is it? Wait, wait. Where do where where do we get the phrase? Where where do we see him on the road? Is it it's in Acts, but is it in is it in his letters? I think it is in his letters. If my brain is any good anymore, well, which letter well, is it in? Well, which, 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 oh, Luke. Wait, 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 wait. What, 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 is it in? Is it important? It's in Galatians, I thought so, yeah. Does he call it on the road to Damascus? He says it on the road to Damascus? Yeah. No, he says he went to Arabia. He went to Arabia, yeah. He went to Damascus. Yeah. Then I went to Arabia. Yeah, see, my brain is as good as you're younger, and yeah. And, I, and I, I went to Arabia, and the whole area was called by the road, not Saudi Arabia, but the whole area was called to Arabia. So he was going way out there to the east. So he had some visionary experience that mean I didn't have to do what James told him to do if he was going to be part of the movement. That's basically what the visionary experience had to do. Well, I told you, first 16 chapters of Acts, I wouldn't rely on for a penny. After the we document comes in, okay, it's in the we document, fine. It isn't in the we document, that I know. That's in the early part of Acts. That's like the Gospels. They're written in the same style as the Gospels, the first 15 uh, the moment the narrative changes from third person to first, I don't mean to be cruel and nasty, but you, know, you have to get the stuff out quick or in a small talk and you have to say the actual truth. Yeah, I have to say it. I don't want to hurt people's feelings, but that's it. Um, anything in the first part of Acts, I wouldn't rely upon you. Okay, so just to clarify, you basically say that the No, I'm not basically saying anything. I'm saying that the Gospels are literature, and the wait, Paul's letters are not. Paul's letters are historical. Some, some are considered to be uh, illegitimate. Other, but I can tell you that Galatians is um, a real piece of uh, letter writing. Corinthians one, part of Corinthians two, Romans, Philippians and so on, these are real letters. And uh, these really, you wanna know Christianity and the nature of Christianity and the nature of the person writing these things? Read Paul's letters, then tell me he's a sweetheart, then tell me he loves his enemy, he hates his enemies, then tell me that he's full of love, he's full of hatred, he's full of anger, he's full of jealousy, he's full of all those things. There isn't a loving bone in his body except he speaks about it. He's the very opposite of what I would call love. So don't talk to me about Christianity being love because Paul is not love. I'm not coming from anywhere. I'm coming from the documents. Okay, so as part of the documents but that gets me anchored. Yeah. No. Roman purposeful no it's literature with an axe it's literature with a purpose it's not like shakespeare it's not just playing games you're wait you're playing history and turning it on its ear in order to change it into something that will support what you're supporting you're taking a, you're taking a messianic movement and then turning it into a pro-roman pro-imperial uh, uh, ideology you're doing that in rome yeah, on purpose because a war has just occurred with some messianists 
who were kind of saying just the opposite and wanted to lead a, a, a world war revolution against everything you represent? Well, if you understand it, you wouldn't ask me anything. What am I, what's that got to do with what I'm, those are, I don't have any, I haven't, what are you talking about? Prophecy is prophecy, prophecy is, pro, there are prophets, so I don't know what, that doesn't mean they're telling the truth, I don't, just because a prophet writes something in his prophecies, what, the Torah, wait, the Torah is prophecy? No, the prophets are prophecies, they're, they're writing, that, that's what we call prophecy, that doesn't mean everything in there is true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, they're not part of the Torah. Don't you know what the Torah is? The Torah are the first five books of Moses, okay? Oh, no, well, you know, you're confusing everything. You're confusing. What's got to do with prophecy? First five books are legal books. That probably the, 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 the legislation of the, of the, of the uh, Davidic monarchical period put into Moses' uh, uh, retrospectively, put into Mount Sinai. This, this is a literary re Representation of an actual uh, legal situation in Palestine in the in the Davidic uh, period. Well, What's the problem? I, I guess I would just want to get your opinion on stuff like um, Isaiah fifty three, like what's that referring? Well, what's to? that got to do with Psalms twenty two? What's that? Referring well, I'm not. I'm not doing what Christianity is doing. I'm not taking things out of context and applying them I'm to just, my beliefs. I, I'm just curious what your what, your what Psalms? The Psalms are supposed to be prophecies. No, the Psalms are just things that were sound, sung in the temple as kind of hymns at the time of the uh, first temple. The, uh, the, the, the prophets are prophets. So if you're taking something out of the prophecies, uh, do I have an opinion about them? Which prophet, uh, which, which line are you talking about? Well, forget Psalm 22. Those are just hymns. I'm not uh, talking about things. In They're not prophecies. No, hymns are not supposed to be prophecies. What, well, give me something from the prophets that you're concerned about. Isaiah 53. What? Recite it to him. To him. What? Like, it says Say, that he was pierced for our So what? Well, I think that... What, he was way pierced? Way. Jesus was pierced? Absolutely. Oh, really? How many times was he pierced? Well, Twelve times. Well, I'm, well I guess I wasn't well, there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> well look, I, mean, I didn't write the documents in Rome, so I don't know how many times he was pierced. I, I can't go through that. So I gave what I gave. I can't go any deeper into that. Yeah. What about Islam? Well, Islam is a very apocalyptic religion, a very unforgiving religion, a religion that doesn't surrender, that doesn't turn the other cheek, that does believe in apocalyptic, apocalyptic war against, so we say, all the, a lot of Dead Sea Scroll material does go into Islam, actually, more than in Christianity. And, uh, you know, the, the ethos of Islam is, is very Dead Sea Scroll-like in its uh, in its uh, uh, um, uh, aggressiveness, in its uh, you know angelic. Uh, uh, but Muhammad is a. I don't want to say he's a. I hate to use the word C R E E P, but he's a nasty piece of work. I know I'm going to get myself going. Uh, take that off the TV now. No. <laughs> Muhammad is not a nice individual. He's a, you know, he's a human being, and most of those writings really do reflect his uh, personality, I think. And if you read the Quran pretty carefully, you'll read that he's a pretty tough, unforgiving, uncharitable uh, uh, person. So as far as Islam is concerned, what do you want me to say about it? It's a tough, tough religion. They swear by the Quran. Now, I have had classes, and I've said in my classes, and I taught Islam at the State University for 35 years. And I can tell you, my, my Islam class is on, is on YouTube. You can go and listen to it. And I think it's a pretty good class. But I said to my classes that I think Islamic civilization is very great, particularly in the Middle Ages. It rose to very great heights. And I said, I think Islamic culture is greater than the Prophet. And all the Muslims in my class would get angry because they love they, they the Prophet, you see. And they don't know their own culture. They don't know their uh, Islamic culture uh, absorb uh, Greek culture, preserve, uh, you know, preserve Plato, Aristotle, all of these Greek works that the West threw in the trash bag. We only got all these when, when in the Renaissance we rediscovered Islam through Spain and the translations, uh, mostly by Jews and others, of Islamic documents into 
Latin and Hebrew, you know, and then the Renaissance popped out of nowhere. But yeah, I think Islamic culture is very great, and I, I'm the first one to say so. But the Quran is, uh, the, you can't say this, so you get your head lopped off, but okay, lop my head off. The point is that I think it's very fine poetry. I mean, it's, it's, it is in rhyme and meter. And it's, uh, you know, the, the, um, the people from whom Muhammad came were, were people, I don't like talking about Islam for this reason, because it's dangerous terrain. It really is very dangerous terrain. And uh, I hope you don't put this up on the, you cut this stuff out about Islam if you're ever putting this stuff up. But it's very dangerous stuff. But, but the point is that <coughs> Islam, uh, Muhammad came out of a, a family of Kahn type people who actually were visionary reciters of a, of a form of, of, of Arabic uh, uh, poetic prose. And he was already trained in this form of Arabic poetic prose and the Quran is recited. That's why they say recite in the word, you know, in the name of Allah. The Quran was already recited in this special rhythmic prose that was rhymed, the special rhythmic rhyme prose that he was a master of. So if you're asking me if it's a great document, yes, because of the, 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 the skill he has as a rhythmic, uh, if you've ever heard Arabs recite the Quran, they go, they go passionate because the rhyme and rhythm drives them into a passionate mindset, we might call frenzy, but I would say an apocalyptic, you know, high. And, and, and so, yes, it's that. But if you want to read it as a prose work, what's in it, be careful. There's a lot of unpleasant things running around in there, and I don't want to get any more specific than that. So Islam is a great religion. Islamic culture is a very great culture. The Quran, which is all, all only what Muslims talk about today, they don't talk about their culture. But you go to Saudi Arabia, you talk about Islamic culture, are you kidding me? They only talk about the Quran. And any Arab or Muslim or any Middle Eastern you meet today never speaks about Islamic culture. Never hear them mention the word Aristotle. Uh, they only talk about the Quran. And that's not all of Islam. But so you've got to differentiate between Islam and the Quran. That's my personal view. I had enough, you guys, you had enough. We don't want to argue, or anyway, have bad days. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to say you're welcome tomorrow. And you have your relationship with your creator. And tonight is a good time for you to have a good talk with him. And to, and let's. Sorry if I hurt your feelings. Don't, don't feel bad. Huh? And thank you. Would you like to say anything, Stan? Oh, I say, um, just let the Lord bless you and like face shine upon you. He was you. just talking a question. Well, we're not in a church at the moment. We're just, we are in a church, but we're not in a church in this lecture. We're just in an academic academic intellectual situation and it's not talking about whether you believe something or you don't believe something or 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 what what, what we're going to do to save the world we just want to know what happened in the world before we came into it yeah. we're not talking about what's going to happen now after this lecture yeah okay, huh. so you're saying that am i saying anything really did I, am i saying something <laughs> Go ahead. You're saying that. so james you're saying Oh, I see, yeah, you see, I didn't get that far. Yes, there's a righteous teacher called, in the scrolls, the righteous teacher. And because they put, I didn't get all that, that scholars put all this in the second century BC because of handwriting styles. I never got onto that. And their Essenes and so on, the second century BC, but I think it's the first century AD, these, these sectarian documents. And that uh, this righteous teacher person is involved in situations that they describe. And James, you know, was called, James the Righteous One, James the, James the Tzadik, James the Dikaios. He was called, he's known as James the Righteous. And uh, uh, the righteous teacher at Qumran is, every time you see the word Tzadik in the prophets, they talk about the righteous teacher or the teacher of righteousness. So to me, the James the Tzadik, the leader of the early church, the real leader of the early church, not the Pauline interloper, uh, was a, a Tzadik. And then we find that the righteous teacher at Qumran was a Tzadik. So yeah, I put all that together and I show the documents like James the Just and the Habakkuk Pesher, which I think is the name of this book here. 
James the Just, because he's James the Righteous One, in the Habakkuk Press, he was known as James Justice in Latin, is the righteous teacher in the Dead Sea Scroll document. So don't, don't worry, they kill me. Don't worry, you'll be very happy to know they crucify me for saying that. But I absolutely think it's true. It's all a matter of dating. I never got into all that because I got tired of it, got sidetracked, and I apologize, but maybe tomorrow. But the, the point is, is the dating of the scrolls, and it's not based on handwriting styles. It's based on the internal data. Yeah. Sure, go on. I don't mind. So do your friends. You can't get it all straight. In, in, in this so the Pauline part of it, it says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yeah. And then it says that the Jews believe that he is the Son of God. And then it says that the Pauline part of it, it says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's an enemy in the scrolls, too. An enemy. There's an enemy. What's the agenda? Anti-law, anti-Moses, anti-Jewish, pro-Roman, everything else that any Herodian citizen uh, any 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 Rhodey family member with a Roman citizen would have. Yeah, the the agenda is just what's happened to the Jews in the modern world, but I've had to put it too simply. A very bad agenda, I hate to say. No, he just incorporates that into his concept, concept of the Jewish Messiah. He steals the Jewish messianic idea and turns him into a, ver a fairly anti-Jew. Everything that the Jews rejected Christ, the Jews this, the Jews that. He went first to the Roman soldiers and they accepted him and blah, blah, blah. All of that stuff is, 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 is calculated to turn your mind into the direction of the good or goodness of the Romans and the badness of the Jews. Pontius Pilate, one of the worst governors in Palestine, we know from Josephus, who didn't hesitate to crucify anyone, didn't want to crucify Jesus. He wanted to free him, but the Jews wanted him crucified, don't you know? And so on and so forth. All that is calculated to turn your mind into the way it is at the present time. Not yours, but the world. Well, what do you say about the people who read Paul's writings and really love them, uh -huh. aren't turned against, against the Jews? The Jews. You don't believe that at all. Well, we'd have to go through Paul passage for passage, and I can show you that you can't read be, be you can't be reading Paul very carefully if you if you think that I could get you I could get you passages out of Paul. Oh, let me see if I can find you some passages out of Paul here. I think I have some passages here. Well, you know, you you're seeing what you want, perhaps in Paul. Well, I didn't say it turned you against him, but you're a kind, decent person. But let me see. He said. Um, uh, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth in the Jews, the enemy in the scrolls, the enemy of the righteous teacher? Uh, uh, there is an enemy uh, called the enemy in the righteous teacher. I, I can't do I have to do uh, you carefully keep days and months and years. I'm afraid that you, for fear somehow, I have labored in vain regarding you. Brothers, I beg of you. Be as I am, for who I am, you are. You did not wrong me in any, but you know that through the weakness of the flesh I preach the gospel, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I have become your enemy, but it is right to be zealous in a right thing. I use the zealot terminology, uh, and not only when I am present with you, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'd have to read the whole thing passage by passage by passage. Uh, so, so then, brothers, we're not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. The Jews, he says here, are children of the slave woman, Hagar. The Old Testament has lied to you because the Jews are slaves to the Mosaic law. We are free of the law as Jesus. Therefore, we are children of the free woman, Sarah. I, come on. There's so much anti-Semitic stuff in here, I couldn't even start the camera. I, I, I hate to say it, but I have to read it. Yeah. Why don't you just put on my course that I do on Paul and James? Yeah, I, I just don't want to get all worked up about it, you know? You'd have to read the stuff carefully, you know? You know, it's amazing to me how difficult it is. Thank you. Huh? I don't know what they are, but I hope they're better than people think they are. Sure, sure. <laughs> That's what I have there. I'll put these other books in here while you look at them. I didn't mean to get angry, but I just can't yeah, yeah. I can't deal with those kind of things. I'm not a person who can deal with people's faith. That's their own problem.
and if you can't see this uh, closing anti semi, well, then I kind of lost, lost track a little bit, but I. You were talking about anti semites first. Yeah. Okay. And then there was something, a little bit of history on this, where, where um, Hitler, you know, for example. He's, I understood that he took something from. I don't know. I can't explain that. I, I don't have. I don't have a. Inside of that. I didn't know it was my company. It was a young lady and a friend, but uh, that's what I can do if you're going to tell me that you don't see hatred and Paul. I lost my. Right. Yeah, I know. I think it's pretty important. I went off and do it. It has to do with the nationality Judaism. Judaism is a rabbinic uh, argumentation back and forth. Not just about well, Judaism. Now. But now the Jews are a people, they're not a race. That's right. Yeah, they're a people. He's turned into a race. You know? People, the people, the race is not going to be a part of the race. That's duty that not too long ago. <laughs> that's, that's unfortunate that he yes. used that race language, you know, it was popular in his time. But there are uh, Caucasian people just like any other, like sure. Turks or, you know, you know, Russians or Europeans or whomever were from that part of the world. Armenian. Or yeah, yeah, right, right, right. You know, even the Iraqis and so on. Yeah. You know. But as you go further south, then you get into a different culture. You are an intelligent man. What right? happened? I think, those did, I think they did well towards the end. I didn't do those questions. Well, it's, I mean, you've lived this before. We didn't think you did well. Yeah. It's just another day. So you did like, great. Like, okay? thought, well, that's fine, but I, I, I can't, you can't do with people's faith. I, I understand that. I understand that. It's, you fought long and hard to be where you're at. Yeah, so. I, I can't help that they can't say anything negative when they're reading somebody full of negativity. <laughs> I have to read it past. Passage by passage, and I have that in my courses and all that. And something fell down on the floor here. I saw it then. Jack. You can get them all over RobertEisenman.com. They're all listed on there. All the books are there. Or this guy, the one who, um, this publisher here, this guy here, Grave Distractions. He publishes all these. Yeah, that was what I was writing uh, in Israel when I was living on the West Bank, uh, experiencing these uh, things I write about in the essay. You know, it's, it's an incredible thing to be in an academic situation yeah. where it isn't your opinion. And and to just have a discussion, it's just it's such a refreshing thing. Well, that's kind of to say. Well, we, we yeah. try to do our best, and um, as you see, it's some people upset emotionally. But it's only because it's a spirit. It's a we're used to sitting and, and absolutely believing everything the person well, says. Well, you know, as I said, she's good. What upset me there is that you can't read Paul without seeing that. I mean, you can read through, you know, half your letters. I mean, you have to be each one. Okay, so if the person doesn't see it, I don't know.